comic really resonates with oh hello uh, <laughs> that comic really resonates with me because I think as a parent oftentimes we feel like uh, we are ad libbing and we're not really know what to do uh, but we're expected to but the good news is that um, as professionals, we we know a lot about what to do. There's been lots and lots of research over the years that tells us evidence-based approaches for how to support kiddos through their stress. So we're not really ad-libbing it. Um, and we're here to share some of what we know to be true from the research as well as from our own work uh, with young children. So just wanted to add that. Thanks. All right. So that being said, given all of that context, it is important to pause and check in with yourself and your emotions um, because these past few years have brought up a lot of feelings that are complicated and challenging even for adults to navigate. Um, and I know I've thrown out feelings of stress and exhaustion, but it may be the case that those aren't as primary for you in this moment or that they're coinciding with lots of other feelings as well. So we wanted to hear from all of you and you can type into the Q&A um, and Stephanie will read some of these out just about how you've been feeling lately. Just waiting for folks to put in the chat some of their feeling words they've been feeling. I can say in this very moment, I'm feeling frustrated um overwhelmed I'm also a little bit excited for the soccer game tomorrow to see if Argentina will move forward out of group C I hope that wasn't too controversial to say um okay so overwhelmed frustrated yep from the expectations yes we have expectations from coming at us from many different places mm -hmm. um Yep. You know, the good point around that we um, are needing to be in the office and be at work, um, which is stressful. Yet at the same time, school has so many days off um, and it's very hard to balance those needs. That resonates with me a lot. Um, sad and worried. Um, again, worried, overwhelmed. Okay. Thank you for sharing those. I think that um, there are the feelings of sad and worry and overwhelmed and frustrated um, that folks put in are probably feelings that many of us have right now. Um, mm -hmm. But I hope there's also some positive feelings that are part of that as well. Excited for the holidays um, and feeling good coming off of a long weekend, perhaps. Yeah, and we will come back to this, but this checking in with and labeling our own emotions helps us recognize and take care of our needs. And it's also the same process we can use to help support our children and understanding how they're feeling and navigating those feelings as well. I think that's a good point. Many of us don't spend the time checking in. How am I feeling? Um, and certainly aren't used to expressing that. So we didn't get a lot of comments on that because I think we're just not used to that. Um, and it's so important, we'll see for our children, um, that we do start to um, talk about feeling words and build their feeling vocabulary so that they know how to express themselves in appropriate ways. Yeah, so we, you know, there's a lot of difficult feelings happening and it's, very okay to have them. And in order to um, take care of our children, we have to take care of our feelings too. So um, a lot of us have been here where this red red guy is holding up the, the bridge um, and, you know, being here for our kids during this time, taking on like heavy burdens and kind of pushing through things at our own expense, but it's not sustainable long-term. So if this red person who's holding everything up is exhausted and slumped everybody falls down um so when we are kind of picking up the pieces filling in the gaps and resetting after 
years of pandemic life, that means recreating a strong foundation that works for all of us to feel safe and stable and equipped to manage life's challenges. Um, and so children need our calm in order to find their calm. So these things that we're talking about today, um, doing them for yourself is the same, um, is just as important as you know, doing them for your children. It's helping everybody. So um, there's a direct impact of caring for yourself on your kids. Um, so you're, you're attending this webinar to learn more about how you can support your child's social and emotional development. And one of the biggest ways is taking care of you. Um, so when you create an environment of stability and safety and calm for yourself, you're creating that for your kids and it allows you to be there for them. And children are always looking to us for signals of what emotions are appropriate for a situation and how we navigate big feelings. Um, and it can be very difficult to be calm in a world that is so stressful. So our job as adults is to try to be thoughtful about um, what we need to do to manage our own feelings and behaviors. And one good place to start in this process is reflecting on what's running um, through our minds. So what we're thinking. All right, so um, given that there's so much going on in the world right now that's hard and that we can't control, we may um, understandably have some unhelpful thoughts that pop up about ourselves and the world and our work, our kids, our abilities. And when we don't have control over what's going on in the world or our lives, what we do have control over is how we're thinking about those things. So one of the greatest weapons we have against stress is our ability to change our thinking, or in other words, challenge our perspective or shift our frame of mind. Um, so we've got this kind of triangle here because how we think shapes how we feel and how we behave and vice versa. So um, when we think about how to cope with and navigate big feelings, we can change how we're thinking and that might shift how we're feeling and behaving. So we'll go into an example here. Um, one way we, oh, go ahead, Stephanie, did you want to jump in? Nope, I was just getting ready to read what comes into the chat. Ah, okay. So as Maria prompts you, please put in the chat um, her prompts about how you might be feeling or how you might respond to each of these thoughts. All right, so yeah, here's an example of a shift in perspective. So if you're thinking, my kid won't stop crying, he's driving me crazy, how might you feel? And how might you respond to your child? So go ahead and type that into the chat. I know that I will start by saying that if my child wouldn't stop crying um, and he was driving me crazy, it would probably make me feel super annoyed. And if I'm annoyed, it's probably going to be more likely that my response would be something of the order of stop crying. Okay, I admitted that, yet yeah, no one is putting <laughs> something else in the chat. How else might you be feeling? I just want to remind everyone um, that it's the Q&A where folks can write in a comment or a question. And I want to answer the question. Great. Please do. <laughs> My kid won't stop crying. He's driving me crazy. Why is the question, why, why might the child be crying? Is that the question you want a response for or how would I react? How would you feel or react if you're thinking, my kid's driving me crazy right now? So Janet, as you're thinking of your answer, I'll, I'll tell you what folks are starting to jump in with. Okay. They're likely to be feeling overwhelmed or annoyed with their child's stress. Uh, why can't I help him feel better? Absolutely. That sense of what am I doing wrong? What do I need to do differently to help? 
Um, yo tengo un, un niño travioso, which I'm not sure what Janet helped me with travioso. Um, travieso. Travieso. And what does that mean? Um, very active. Ah. Um, yeah, maybe sometimes hard to so, handle. <laughs> so, yes. So I have a child who's hard, to, who's active and hard to handle, uh, feeling tapped out. Um, ah, so the, here's a great example. So in this example, someone says that this might make me feel tapped out. And so they're likely to respond by walking away and taking some breaths. That is a fantastic response. Um, and but yes, and then another uh, parent said that um, if they were feeling overwhelmed and stressed or annoyed by the behavior, they would probably answer in a bad tone um, and ask themselves, what am I doing wrong or what am I not doing? So you can really see that how you think really shapes how you respond. Luckily, Maria has an option of something else, a different way you can think. So that same behavior of my child is crying. So in this same situation, if you took a step back and kind of shifted, another way of looking at it is he's having a really hard time and he needs my help to feel safe and calm. So if you were able to tell yourself that in that moment when your child's having a hard time, then how might you feel? or respond. And I'll start by sharing that I would probably have some empathy. I would feel um, sad for him because he's having a hard time. And I would likely respond by taking some deep breaths so I can remain calm and then listening for how can I help? What can I do to help him feel better? How about others? Sounds like most folks are saying that they're kind of agreeing with what I was saying, that they would be okay. more be able to be more present and calm and mm -hmm. look for ways to support rather than um, yell. Uh, one parent said, I would give a hug and I would ask, what is make, what would make her feel better? Um, and then perhaps help her or him take space. Mm -hmm. Hugging it out is a very common strategy that I see coming up. All right, nice. great. Yeah, so pausing and reflecting and doing this type of reframing of like, what's another way I can look at the situation that might be more helpful or help me stay more calm takes a lot of practice, but it's a very powerful tool for managing our own emotions and stress so that we can be there for our children and help them through difficult times. We're going to so do, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to give, as you're moving forward, give another mm -hmm. example. Let's say you see your child is making a huge mess. Uh, maybe a, a, one of your young childs, one of your babies is making a huge mess. And you might think, oh my gosh, my child is doing that on purpose just to make me mad. Um, and then you're likely to yell or respond in very impatient ways versus if you say, wow, look at my child is exploring his environment. He's such a little scientist. Then you're more likely to be able to stay calm and deal with the situation in a, in a, in a more present, positive way. Same behavior, you just, your feelings and responses differ because you think of it in a different way. So there's, there's a couple more examples of think, ways of thinking that we could try to step back and reframe. So for she's out of control and I don't know what I can do to help her, um, one option might be she's showing me how stressed she is 
right now. Um, or we're going through some big changes and she doesn't know how to respond to this. Um, or if you're thinking, my kid is so anxious and won't stay at school, I might have to leave work and I could lose my job. Another way to step back and think about that a little differently might be, this is really hard, but we're going to figure it out together. So there might be lots of options for ways you might reframe it, think a little bit differently about it. Um, and then again, feel more compassionate, empathetic, hopeful, um, and respond in ways like you were sharing with hugging it out um, or being you know, warm, but setting a firm limit, just acknowledging how hard it is, acknowledging their feeling um, or giving space to cool off rather than it leading to a big fight. So some of those things you all already shared. Another thing that can be helpful as we're thinking about mindset um, is the day-to-day -day things that we do that shape our thinking beyond kind of like our broader context and the issues we mentioned earlier. Um, a few examples of this are just scrolling through the news or media and seeing lots of stories about things that are happening that are difficult or upsetting, um, comparing ourselves to others on social media. You know, that happens a lot and it's really difficult not to do. Um, those social comparisons and thinking about um, or keeping in mind that, you know, others might project happiness and ease and their like online personas. Um, and that might shape how we're thinking about things um, or our expectations for ourselves or our parenting partners or our children. Um, and that might lead to expectations that are too high or too low. Um, or getting kind of looped into other people's drama. So just noticing these other things that are happening that might be negatively affecting us so that we can walk away, take a break or limit them when needed. If we notice that they're starting to kind of shape our thinking or cause us to feel more negative. We can also tune into signs of stress in our children and noticing um, when they're going through a harder time and might need some more support. Um, so, you know, the stress of the pandemic and the world didn't just go away when we took off our masks or went back to school. Children are still dealing with a lot of challenges and changes. Um, and so you may see things like mood swings, um, acting out you know, throwing more tantrums or arguing, changes in sleep, going back to napping more often, having a hard time sleeping or having nightmares, regression in toilet training, um, having accidents, wetting the bed. You might hear more somatic complaints when kids are stressed. So headaches, tummy aches, um, see them using comforting habits, sucking their thumbs or twirling their hair. You might see changes in eating habits, changes in appetite, um, or changes in interests. So it's important to, to be looking out for these things when they're happening with our kids so we can recognize when they might be in need of a little bit more support. Um, and another thing we can remind ourselves is that kids are doing the very best that they can with what they've got to. Um, so thinking about what can we give them to help them find ways to manage the stress. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about managing our own stress, kind of shifting our mindset. Um, and now we're going to talk more about how to support your children. Um, so as we're thinking about this, it's helpful to keep in mind that children express how they're thinking and feeling through their behaviors. So think like one thing that can be helpful is asking yourself, what is my child trying to communicate? Um, so you know them best, you know their cues, their emotions, you see their shifts in behavior when things are a little bit different. 
Um, so it's helpful to step back and ask yourself, what are these things telling you? Um, for a child who's um, usually, you know, goes along with homework, this time they're crumpling it up and throwing it on the floor. What is that saying? Is it that they're frustrated, overwhelmed? Maybe it's too hard or too much homework. They need help. They need a break. Um, trying to look at the behavior and ask yourself, what is the message here? Or what are they feeling in this moment? So we're going to go through three essentials that help children feel safe and promote their adjustment, even when the world seems unpredictable or scary. Um, and those are routines, reassurance, and regulation. So we all um, thrive on routine. Unpredictability is stressful, and we can feel out of control when we don't know what's going to happen. And that's definitely true for children as well. So having that consistency and predictability in their routine provides a sense of security and safety. And they know what's expected of them and what's gonna happen next. So it's easier for them to behave in the ways that we expect. With reassurance, reminding children that they're safe and that their feelings are valid. It's okay to feel those big feelings and that you will be there to help them through it and help meet their needs. Um, and then with the regulation, finding ways to keep our calm so we can help them find their calm and teaching them the calming strategies that they can use when they're having those big feelings. So when we're thinking about routines, what can be helpful um, is having a daily schedule and having it posted wherever possible, giving our children a chance to make choices within that routine as well, to give them a little bit of control. Um, and it doesn't have to be kind of step-by-step step every single activity of the day. So meals are a great kind of anchor for schedule, you know, having like breakfast, lunch, and dinner around the same time each day. Um, taking time to connect as a family. So building in connection time too, so that children um, can predict when they'll next be able to have your full attention or communicate with you. Um, another thing that's helpful to build in is um, things that make you happy, give it shape, um, talking about daily highs and lows and make that connection time fun. So building in kind of games and scheduling in free time and breaks. Another thing to keep in mind is sleep. So often when kids' behavior is dysregulated, it's a sign that they are tired or not getting enough sleep. Um, so it can be helpful to think about that bedtime routine and keeping it starting at the same time every evening, um, sleeping in the same place every night and having kind of a quiet, wind down, calming activity before bed to help with that transition. Also helpful to avoid using electronics at night. That screen time can really keep us up. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, consistency is what we're aiming for, but it doesn't have to mean over-controlled. So offering choices to your children where you can. Um, so some examples of that are, you know, it's time to get ready for school, but do you wanna pack your lunch first or get dressed first? So either way, they're doing the things they need to do to get out the door, but they have a little bit of a choice in what comes first. Um, or please start working on your homework. Do you wanna start with math or spelling? Another thing that can be helpful is reminders of what's gonna happen and in what order. So um, first we're going to have a snack and then we're gonna go outside. Can prevent um, disappointment or confusion when they know what's coming first and what's coming next. Um, also possible that, or no, sorry. 
also helpful to give them a heads up whenever possible um, if there are changes coming in the routine to let them know in advance that things are going to look a little bit different today. So if Papa's going to pick you up at school because I have a doctor's appointment or um, I know we usually go to the park after school on Wednesdays, but it's going to storm today. So instead, we'll go home after school and maybe we can work more on that robot we've been building together. Um, it's also important that expectations are clear. So when children know the rules and there's a predictable outcome for following the rules or not following the rules, they're less likely to test those boundaries or act out. It's also really important for kids that all the adults that are with them have the same expectations because it can be hard to adjust when each adult has different rules and expectations. Um, so having a discussion together to um, get on the same page and work towards having common ground with other caregivers can be really helpful for children as well. Another thing to keep in mind with the routine is instead of telling children what they can't do, um, tell them what they can do. So children are, are used to hearing a lot of like what not to do, but it's actually really helpful to, to turn around and tell them, here are the things you can do in this situation. So I just want to give an example of that to make it clear. So you could have a rule that says, um, don't ride your bike out of the neighborhood. A very simple shift to that could be something like, you can ride your bike on Wheeler Street up until Smith Street. I'm making that up. I have no idea if those roads even exist. But the point being that the expectation is the same, but kiddos can hear better when they're told what they can do rather than going through all the things that they can't uh, do. So just shifting how you talk about the rules. Um, another helpful strategy is when there are going to be challenges, something comes up that you think might be difficult, pregame it. Um, so talk about in advance what's going to happen and what your expectations are. Um, so for example, when you're going to a birthday party at the trampoline park in the way when you're, or on the way when you're in your car, um, letting your child know like it's probably going to be really loud. If it gets too loud, you can cover your ears or come tell me that you need a break. If you know that like for your child, a really loud environment can be overwhelming or overstimulating. Anytime you anticipate a situation that can be challenging, taking time to talk it out in advance about what to do sets them up for success and understanding what's expected and um, how to cope with any challenges that come up. Other ways to pregame include planning ahead for yourself to prevent um, difficult things. So bringing activities to keep your child occupied during um, activities you know where there will be like long wait times can also be helpful. And then as you have new routines, so um, for example, you, your brother's soccer practice is starting, so the routine's gonna shift. It can be helpful to both talk it through and even practice through it in advance. So we're going to go to the soccer field after school. You and I will have snacks when we get there and you can pick a toy and some books to bring um, so that they're prepared for the situation and what's expected of them because that's going to be the new routine after school. I just want to jump in because I've been focused, mm -hmm. Maria, on looking at your daily routine picture. Oh, and yeah. I've been thinking about how for so many of us, the morning routine is such a source of stress and such a source of conflict uh, between us and our children. And so I really think following these guidelines that you've put up can be really helpful for, um, for not only helping children see the world in a more predictable way so they feel more safe, but also just reducing the amount of time that you're spending nagging your children to do the things you need them to do um, and fighting with them when they're not doing them. So if you, we take your suggestion, Maria, and we have a visual 
chart that has all the things the child needs to do to get through the morning routine, what are we not spending our morning doing? Nagging them, brush your teeth, wash your face, put away your, your dirty clothes, eat your breakfast, take your vitamins. We don't have to do that. If it's on a scheduled sheet and we give them some responsibility over it, they're more likely to do it and we're less likely to have to nag them. So uh, these are just great suggestions to reduce that icky conflict that happens every morning as everybody's stressed to get out the door. And then the same could be true for evening routines as well. All right. So now that we've talked about routines, sticking with those can be challenging when you're stressed or tired or your child is stressed or tired. And when we think about providing reassurance, um, one really important way to do that is to actually stick to the routine. Um, so even when someone doesn't feel good, you might make changes within the routine, um, but keeping things the same and, and following through with your expectations and limits um, is important because it can prevent difficulties later and adjusting back to the way things were. Um, and just like how your child's behavior might be communicating to you that they're feeling out of control, you being firm and fair and consistent with boundaries and limits lets them know that you are in control and that it'll be okay even when things are feeling out of control. Um, so as I mentioned, you can kind of balance comfort and flexibility with that consistency. So keeping the routine, um, even when you're feeling more stressed or things are difficult, um, you can still kind of offer those extra snuggles or have some flexibility, but preserving what you're doing at consistent times of day and what the expectations are within that. So if, for example, you give a break from the normal bedtime routine or let them stay up late, it can be really hard to go back and return to the normal bedtime without a fight. So just keeping in mind that even though it's, it's tempting to kind of change things up and relax those boundaries sometimes, it makes things more challenging later on. And then in terms of other things to provide reassurance, um, staying with the established routine, but you know, creating opportunities for special time together um, or being a little bit flexible, like we, um, you know, you have to sleep in your bed, I have to sleep in my bed, but once a week we'll find a fun place to sleep together, like camping in the backyard. So still going to sleep at the same time and following the routine if you do change it up. Another thing um, that's reassuring is reading cues and making it specific to your child. So noticing how they express stress and discomfort and the specific ways that they receive comfort and feel comforted by you. Maria, I, I want to yeah. jump in and really highlight something that you mentioned mm -hmm. across both routines and reassurance. And I'm bringing it up in response to some of the comments that I'm seeing Ooh. come in. Um, and it's the importance of you've referenced this term special time. And I just want mm -hmm. to make a little bit more clear what that is. Um, so special time is setting aside as little as five minutes a day, research shows that it only takes five to 10 minutes a day of uninterrupted time with your child, letting your child be in charge of the interaction and choosing what you do together and that you are just present and there and giving your child your undivided attention and not looking at your phone, not trying to cook dinner, not trying to fold the laundry, but really just being present and seeing and hearing your child. Um, and if you do this predictably every day, children act out less to get your attention. But more importantly, as children get older, 
you are providing some reassurance and safety that you are there to hear and to listen. And so um, it's hard for children who are older to open up and talk if they're not used to having that space. So if they're in the habit of having that space every day, maybe at the beginning, they're going to be talking to you about what they're building with their Lego structures. But after a while, that is going to turn into conversations around these are the things that are making me really angry, or I'm feeling scared because, or I feel very anxious in the morning to go to school because. So you invite those conversations when you spend that predictable, uninterrupted time focused on your child, five to 10 minutes a day is all it takes. If I could write prescriptions, that would be the prescriptions I would write for everybody. Spend that five to 10 minutes a day. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks, Stephanie. All right, so we're moving into regulation. Um, and here we're going back to that idea of when children are behaving, that tells us, that gives us messages about how they're thinking and how they're feeling. That's gonna come out through their behavior. Um, so we have an example of a scenario here. Um, where a child is told no when she asks to play with her switch and she screams, I hate you and slams the bedroom door. Um, and as the parent, you respond, you get out here. It's not okay to scream at me like that. Do you hear me? You've lost your bike for the rest of the day. And what happens after that is she starts destroying her room and kind of knocking everything over. So in this scenario, um, when she has this outburst, instead of responding to the emotion, if you respond to the behavior and try to correct the behavior, you can see how um, it can actually exacerbate the situation. So we're going to talk about a strategy to help children through these. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight again that when the child destroys her room, she's saying to you, you didn't hear me. You didn't see me. Um, because what they what she was trying to say when she said no and I hate you is I'm mad. Um, but instead of acknowledging the I'm mad because you um, won't let her play switch, you all of a sudden are trying to connect to the correct the behavior. So the destruction of the room is, well, I was mad before, but now I'm furious because not only was I mad, but you're ignoring me. You're not listening to me when I'm telling you I'm mad. So emotion coaching um, is a process we can follow and a strategy for when your child is upset to acknowledge it and name it and move into what they can do to cope with that feeling. Um, so in that same, we'll go back to that situation. Um, but what this process looks like is just watching, observing them, listening to what they're saying or listen, or yeah, listening to what they're telling you um, and acknowledging their feelings with a word. So uh, you were really disappointed that you didn't get a treat when we were in the store today. I'm disappointed too. I would have liked a treat today. Um, and then you can also offer coping statements like maybe next time, um, or let's think of a snack you can have when we get home. Another thing you can do is suggest positive opposites of the behavior. So um, an example of that is you didn't like it when she grabbed your toy and that made you mad. Try taking some deep breaths to calm your body and now use your words. So the opposite of grabbing is using your words to say, I didn't like that. Please use your words to ask me first. And then the other important thing at the end here is when they do those things and use that strategy that's more effective, really making sure to praise that and reinforce them. So we'll go back to this first scenario here. And so same thing, she's told no when asked to play her switch, when she asks to play her switch and she's really mad. And then in this situation, 
acknowledging it by saying, I can see that you're really mad that I won't let you play your switch right now. Acknowledging the feeling and then moving into a coping strategy or something she can do. So when you use a calm voice, I can understand better how you feel and we can find something else to do. So this both acknowledges how she's feeling in this situation and it's looking at what are other ways that we can meet this need. So something else that she can do. So here's another example. And we're going to practice. Um, so in this situation, a child is saying, I want to go first. So this is two children, older sibling and younger sibling. Um, and the adult might say, he's younger than you. Let him go first. And the child might say back even louder, I never get to go first. I want to go first. And the adult might say, it's only a game. What's the big deal? And then the child gets even louder. It's not fair. And the adult says, that's it. No one plays. You ruined it for all of us. So with this kind of response, what do you think is going to happen next in this situation? Go ahead and type into the Q&A. While you're thinking, my first guess is that that game is going to travel across the room. And I have another parent who is saying there are going to be two meltdowns, the child meltdown and the parent meltdown. <laughs> it's going to boil over. Too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes, actually, three meltdowns, two children, the older <laughs> one, the younger one, and the parent. So I'll raise your two meltdowns to a three. <laughs> Right. And again, what that really stems from is the child feeling unheard, that it's it doesn't feel fair to me um, that he always gets to go first. Yep. And the, the comment also just came in, no one's going to want to play anymore because it just yeah. leads to bad feelings. Right. Okay. So now we're going to look at a redo. Of what happens when the adult acknowledges the feeling and uses emotion coaching. So in this scenario, when the child says, I want to go first, the adult says, let's figure out a fair way to decide who goes first. And the child gets louder and says, I never get to go first. I want to go first. And in this moment, the adult acknowledges the child's feelings. It feels like he always gets his way because he's younger. I know that that's hard. And when the child wails, it's not fair. The adult responds with another option. So let's flip a coin and let the coin decide who goes first this round. And if it's not you this time, it'll be you next time in the second round. So what do you think might happen in this situation? Anything coming into the Q&A? Nope, and I'm trying to zip it, lock it, put it <laughs> in my pocket for once. So um, I'll make a comment, of course, because okay. I cannot. Um, <laughs> What I really think is, is I'm sort of um, repeating the same message, but I think this key, when you say it feels like he always gets his way because he's younger, I know that's hard. Just being able to put words to that child's feelings and to acknowledge them and say, I get that's hard for you. I'm thinking that that is going to lead the child to be more open to your solution mm -hmm. of flipping the coin. I think if you just left that out and you were just to say, 
um, if when the child says, I want to go first, and you just um, go right into, well, let's flip a coin, um, that that wouldn't work so well, the child, because the child still isn't being acknowledged for feeling mad. So start with acknowledge the feeling and then think of a solution, but always start with what is this saying about how my child is feeling? Yep. And one of the parents just put in that she also, she and he also agree that they might be a little upset, but they're probably more open to playing the game. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We have another example, but I am going to skip through that one just for time's sake to keep us moving. I will say while you're orienting yourself, Maria, that I'm really not having, I'm not saving any questions yet. Um, okay. So at this point, we don't have any outstanding questions. Um, so continue if you have questions to put them in the chat, um, but I won't cut Maria off yet because there's nothing coming. Okay. Um, so as we're thinking about emotion coaching, some of the ways to do this, so we were talking about, you know, acknowledging the child's emotions making emotions part of your everyday vocabulary and describing how your child is feeling and when you what you notice about that. Um, you know, I can see you're really happy with your work. I can tell by the big smile on your face that you're super proud of how it turned out. Um, or you feel sad and your voice is shaking. You did not like having to say goodbye to grandma. I'm sad too. Um, Helping them understand how each feeling looks or sounds will help them to be able to recognize how they're feeling and tune into their own bodily cues as well and others. So um, that might be just something as simple as look at his face right now. I think his face is telling you that he's angry and he did not like what you just said to him. Mm -hmm. um, so really to try to coach your kiddos to tune into their own and their friends and the adults emotions around them and just using more adult language, uh, more emotion language yourself. Hey, I'm excited because it's the sun is shining and we're going to get to go to the park or I'm pretty proud of myself. This dinner I made is really good. Yeah, so it's great to also model the words that they can use by doing that yourself, expressing your own feelings. Um, and then some other things to keep in mind too are just naming both the uncomfortable feelings and the positive feelings. So some of those examples, like noticing when they're happy or excited and labeling that or talking about how that feels in their body in addition to when they are disappointed or frustrated. Um, and then scheduling emotion check-ins can be helpful before and after school. So making it part of the routine to talk about how we're feeling every day. Um, and another thing that can be really helpful is praising children when they do communicate. So thank you for telling me how you feel. It helps me know how I can help you. Um, and then finally, books about emotions can be super helpful to have available at home or check out at the library. And we're going to share some recommendations for those as well. So as um, a general summary of the things we've gone over today, noticing your own thinking and how that's affecting how you're feeling and behaving and opportunities to pause and see if there's a way to shift your own perspective can be really helpful in, in managing your own feelings and making sure you're available to support your children. Um, and as we're thinking about routines, that healthy eating and sleep um, and just routines in general really, really help to support regulation. Because um, it's hard to navigate big feelings when we're tired or hungry or we don't know what's coming next. Um, another big one is modeling calm and regulated behavior and what that looks like. Um, so taking space when you're frustrated or taking deep breaths before you speak. 
um, and modeling those parts of the routine of eating healthy, going to bed at a certain time. And then validating how they're feeling when your children are having big emotions, that things are hard or different or changing. Um, asking yourself, what is my child's behavior telling me about how they're feeling right now or what they might need? And then connecting that to a coping strategy that they can use. Um, another important one, I don't think we introduced this yet, but finding out what your child's school is doing and then how you can reinforce that at home. Um, so if there are certain routines, expectations, um, ways that they are talking about feelings or behavior at school, it can be helpful to know about that and be able to provide that same consistency at home. Um, and just keeping in mind that every day is another opportunity to practice emotion coaching and get back into the routine. Um, and, you know, mistakes are going to happen. We'll get upset. We'll have big feelings. Um, so just recognizing that when you do, um, it's another opportunity to take responsibility, apologize, say what you'll do different next time, like model those same things for your child that you want them to do. And then here are some books. These are for younger children. There's some good options here about a range of different emotions um, and some coping strategies. So I'll leave these up for a little bit. Um, and then we've got some books for older children as well. These are some examples of books about emotions for older children. It can be really helpful just to set the stage for talking about emotions and ways to navigate them and cope with them and seeing examples of how other people or other children do that. And as we're wrapping up here, kind of looking ahead, um, there are always going to be unknowns and uncertainty. Um, so our goal really is to create predictability and routine where we can, and then help our children to develop coping strategies and to use our own coping strategies for when we can't control things. And then this quote here, resilience doesn't mean bouncing back to normal. It means being transformed to a new normal, toward a new normal. I think that that's a really great quote, just in thinking about um, that maybe going back to where we were isn't the goal, um, but in having gone through some really tough, hard, stressful stuff, we've learned some stuff about how to cope. We've learned some stuff about how to meet each other's needs. So I don't, again, I don't think the goal is to go back, but is to move forward in a different way um, and take with you what you've learned. Mm -hmm. And what you want to cultivate as your new normal going forward. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Mm -hmm. So I do have some questions that have come into the chat. Um, mm. If you don't mind, I'd also like to share... Um, so um, the strategies that we've talked about tonight, as I said at the beginning, really come from research on what we know about what works um, to support children who are experiencing a lot of stress. Um, but I wanted to put up another resource for families. Um, this content comes, um, uh, a lot of it we took from a program called The Incredible Years, which is an evidence-based program to support 
parents and to help parents learn strategies to basically do the things that we talked about in this presentation and to come together with other parents who are having similar stressors to all think together about how best to support their children. Um, and these are offered in our community everywhere, but I'm going to put up the flyer for a group that will be starting in um, in January, I believe, in at the Bradley Hospital. There's also groups of it that are available um, in Spanish at Gateway. But if you call the number on the screen, the 432-1119, they can help you connect to these groups um, for the six to eight age range, or if you have younger children for groups for younger children. But it really is a fantastic way to get support and to learn strategies for how to help children learn self-regulation um, and school readiness skills and to be more likely to respond positively and behave well at home. Okay, so with that, so one of the questions that we received is, um, is a child throwing tantrums also stress in the child? So in other words, is, is the reason that the child's throwing tantrums, I think what's being asked is, are they throwing tantrums because they're stressed? And um, the answer is maybe, who knows? You know, we a child tantruming um, could definitely re reflect that the child is stressed, but there are lots of reasons that children um, express themselves by throwing tantrums. It could be basic that they're dysregulated because as Maria was saying, they're hungry or they're tired or their routine is off. You know, if you think about your children um, after daylight savings time, their behavior is off and you probably saw a lot more whining and complaining and even tantrums just because their schedule is different. So it could be just dysregulation um, from, from or not feeling well. Um, but children also throw tantrums because they're angry and they don't have words to express how they're feeling or they're frustrated or they're stressed. And so they express with their fists and with their tears and by throwing themselves on the floor because they don't have the words yet to say, mom, I'm angry because you're not letting me have my play date. And so that's why Maria has made the suggestions she has around helping children learn their voice, giving them the words to help them be able to say, I am angry at you, mom, because if they're saying I'm angry at, your mom, at you, mom, they're less likely to throw the tantrum. And then honestly, sometimes children throw tantrums because they work. They work to get their needs met. So I, my son asks me if he can watch TikTok on his iPad and I say no, and he throws a big tantrum, I may give in and let him watch um, his on his iPad because I just am too annoyed to hear him tantrum. So sometimes children throw tantrums because they've learned it's a way to get their needs met or they've learned it's a way to get attention. But um, another reason that children throw tantrums is because it's a sign that they're stressed. Um, let's see. Um, I also received, um, it is in Spanish, so I'm doing my best to translate it with my limited knowledge of Spanish. But what I'm understanding is that um, there's a parent who's feeling frustrated because they're trying to get help for their son um, and the school is not following through. Did I get that right, Janet? Yes. Okay. Um, and so I, I can say that that is incredibly frustrating and it feels really bad when you're working so hard um, to support your children and you're feeling perhaps that they're, that others are not there to support you. Um, I hope this is okay to say, Janet, but I will encourage you to reach out to parent advocates that are there to help you have a voice and to help you advocate for your children's best interests in the school. Um, yes. So those are available for you. Yeah, I would, I would add, um, that they can call our office and we can facilitate, you know, a oh, conversation um, with the principal, with someone else, the support staff, 
um, but they can call us. Uh, you know, our number is 401 456 0686. Yeah. Um, and thank you for that comment. Any other questions? We have one. Um, Aaron's asking, you know, can you refer basically um, a hospital where their eight year old can be treated? Well, that's a hard question to answer, Janet, just because it's without knowing more about um, what um, the, the child and the family need um, and where they live. That's a hard question to answer. However, um, I will say that, um, you know, I, I, we work for Bradley Hospital. Um, so, um, we always recommend starting there at their intake line, um, and they can be helpful in terms of guiding you to the right match or the right place where you need to go, um, because there's different services for different, different ages, different needs, different locations. Okay. Um, and someone is asking for the numbers again, um, I'm not, are you, are, are you referring to the number for the parenting group? If so, it's on your screen. It's 432-1119. Oh, there we go. I wonder if we were sharing at the same time. They might not have been able to see it. Oh, okay. I don't think they were able to know. Okay, oh, so now it's up though. Got it. Okay. Thank you for that, Maria. Yep. So yes, this is the um, this is the slide that is the flyer for the parenting group that is starting in January. Um, and you can call 432-1119 to get hooked up to that service. Um, I have another parent who's asking, can you tell me more about what Bradley Hospital is? So Bradley Hospital um, is a children's psychiatric hospital that has a range of services. Um, it's in East Providence, but it serves all over Rhode Island. Um, but they serve um, early childhood, so babies, um, up through um, preschool age. And then they, they serve children who are early school age up through teenagers. So there's a huge range of children and families that they serve uh, for a range of issues, ADHD, um, challenging behaviors, depression, anxiety, children with developmental disabilities, autism. There are a host of programs for the children um, as well as for parents to learn how to best support their children. Um, anything else you would like to say about, oh, sorry, I'll also say, they have um, a range of educational programs as well as outpatient treatment um, programs um, the ed groups, as I was referring to before, and they have more intense services, partial hospitalization programs, residential programs, and inpatient units. So there's a huge range of services that are provided depending on the needs of your child. And when you call the intake line, intake line they'll help um, navigate to um, the best match of services for your for your child's needs. Anything else you'd like to say about that? Okay. All right. Um, hold on just a second. I'm translating another comment. Mm. Stephanie, I can just translate them for you. So I, okay. I got it, but go ahead. Okay, so which one? Because now there's actually, yo tengo un niño, so I'll read it out loud because folks mm -hmm. can read it. Yo tengo un niño con autismo y quiero ver qué puedo hacer para que me ayuden a educarlo, porque se me hace difícil para hacer las tareas y eso. Mm -hmm. I have a child who's autistic and I want to know what I could do to help them mm. educationally because it's very difficult um, to help him with his homework. Yes. So I would imagine that um, there are a number of challenges um, that you're facing it and that you want to learn more about how you can help him is such um, an important and noble thing. 
Um, two things that I would recommend um, would be um, seeking out support from the Autism Project. Um, the Autism Project is um, a peer-based approach. So you would be working with other parents who have children with autism and they deliver educational programs and support groups. And they also go into the schools and help you advocate for your children. And they do some training of teachers, um, but they're a great program to support parents in understanding more what, an, what a diagnosis of autism means and how they can best support their child. I'll also tell you that um, I had put up the, I think I still have it up, don't I? Um, the handout for the Incredible Years program. There are specific Incredible Years groups uh, that are designed for parents with children with autism. So it's a specific program that was developed to help support children who are um, on the autism spectrum on how to help them communicate and how to help them regulate. So if you call that same number, they'll help you navigate to the specialized groups for children with autism. Okay. Um, yes, so we're also getting a comment about how um, children can act very differently in school than they can than they do at home. Is that what that says? Ah, see, this is great for helping me work on my Spanish. Um, yes, it is often the case that children um, act differently in different settings. Sometimes they um, are really well behaved at school and they acted at home because it's a safe place for them to act out. But the opposite is also true that sometimes children are well behaved at home, but when they get to school, they have a much harder time because the demands of the classroom are far greater. There's more children, there's more noise, there's more predictability, there's less predictability, there's more demands on them. So they may act out differently in different locations. So it can be very confusing. Um, but as a parent, I really understand when, um, you know, if I, if I'm frustrated by my child won't listen and follow rules at home and if, for a teacher to say something like, really? But he does so well at school. He always follows my rules. Like nothing can feel worse as a parent than to hear that. Um, Okay, how long does a child stay at Bradley? And can you explain to us what is the quiet room? Okay, so um, the length of stays at Bradley really depend on the treatment that's being provided. Um, some is outpatient where they um, see a professional once a week on an outpatient basis. Um, uh, um, up to a more extensive inpatient where they're in the hospital setting or in a residential program. So there's no answer to your question other than it really varies. Um, in terms of what is meant by a quiet room, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. If that's something that's language that's used at Bradley Hospital, I'm not familiar with that term. Um, but if you if you can give me more details, perhaps I can try to answer that. Um, and, um, I'm also getting the question about how do we support, how do we access programs for children who are older than the six to eight that are on the screen? And I think that's a great question. Um, again, I'm going to point you to the best place is to call the number and they'll help direct you to other services that are available for other kids. Um, let's see. This one, I think I'm going to have to put into Google, Google Translate. And this, I think, is unfortunately going to have to be our last question of the night. Which one um, are you really... in mi hogar? Oh. One? Yes. Mm -hmm. En mi hogar tengo el problema semejante. Mi hijo no se enfoca en clase y no sigue instrucciones. Se nos hace difícil para la maestra y para mí. In my, in my home, I have the same issue. My, my child um, does not focus in class and doesn't follow instructions. It's very difficult for the teacher and myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that's really nice about a setting like this is how parents um, can relate to each other. And it's really, can you can find great comfort in knowing that you're not alone, that other parents are struggling with similar things to you are. 
It is not that you are a bad parent. It's not that you've done something wrong. It's not that you're not doing something that you should be doing. Um, it's finding the right fit between a child's needs and what the environment and what adults have to offer that child. Um, and it's about establishing a relationship which, among all the adults that support the child, the school, the home, and everybody to take a similar approach um, to support that kiddo. But... Okay. So we want to thank you so much, Stephanie and Maria. Um, this uh, conversation has been very interesting because as parents, we're not perfect. But, you know, we can learn from each other. And the examples that you that you shared um, were very relative, right? Because obviously we're all living in um, different situations, but um, they were pretty relative. So I'm glad that you shared this number. If you can just increase the view of, um, if you can. You able yes, to I will share it again. Just so that the number. Um, we can I'm just trying. Share. Hold on. Just a second. Ah, it's not. Oh, wait. I think I can do, I can do this. I can do hard things. I'm changing my self-talk instead of, I'm so embarrassed because I look really dumb on this video right now. I'm going to say I can do hard things and look, I did it. Yes, you did. <laughs> yeah. So this number is pretty important. 432-1119. Um, Stephanie, uh, you do have, um, uh, interpreters, folks that speak a different language when folks call? So thank you. Um, I believe that, yes, when you call that number to the outpatient department, they have a mechanism to make sure that you either speak to someone in the in your preferred language or there's a translator available. Okay. Um, yeah, so someone just asked, um, you know, so call this number so that they can, you know, kind of guide us moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so should parents be prepared to have a specific question like this line is is considered a hotline is that what you said no no oh i'm so sorry mm -hmm. so this is a um a number where you can register to get services so I am just giving you one of many numbers you can call at Bradley Hospital. And while I'm talking, Maria is going to look up the, ge the general Bradley Hospital line. Mm -hmm. um, but it is they are not going to be giving you suggestions like a hotline, but they're going to assess whether you qualify um, for services and help figure out which services are the best for you. Very good. And Maria, um, did you find that number? Yes. What would be, where would it be helpful for me to put it? Or do you just want me to read it? Um, if you could read it and then I'm going to stop my share and you can just type it in to, to... a word document or something. Oh yeah, I can do that. Yep. Okay. Um, so it is 401-432-1000 is the main line that you can call. So that's going to get you to any, if that's where you're going to call and say, here is what I'm struggling with. I don't know what to do and I don't know what I need. And then they'll say, they'll hook you to the right program. That's exactly what a parent just asked. So if you don't know what they really need, but you can describe it is basically what you're saying. Yes. Um, but you yep. can do that from that number that you just mentioned, 432-1000. Yes. Yeah, I will um, share that. Another strategy is always to have this conversation with your child's pediatrician, um, and they should be aware of, of um, referral sources where they can send you um, to hook you up to appropriate services. Oh, now you're back. Yeah, that's it. Is it that's back it. on it? Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. So four, uh, 401, 432, 1000 is the general Bradley number, and they'll be able to navigate, help you navigate to where you need to go. Very good. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time, for your expertise and guidance. Um, we hope that, um, you know, our families that have joined the Zoom 
um, obviously leave with more information that can help them also understand and communicate better um, with uh, their, their children. Okay, well, thank you so much again. We um, hope that you will join us at another time, either at the, the spring sessions. We have some spring sessions um, in the future, in this case, between March and April. So I'll be back in touch with you um, to see if there's some, you know, another topic. And I'll share the feedback that comes back from um, our families just to let you know what might be some other topics that were relative and maybe um, additional information on a specific area that you mentioned today. Okay. Fantastic. Sounds good. And thank you all for your participation and for yeah. your for listening and good luck to your raffle winners. <laughs> thank you so much. So just a reminder, our families not to leave. So thank you so much, Stephanie and Maria. Have a great evening. Okay. Thanks. You too. Welcome. Take care. Bye. You too. Bye. And again, for anyone who might have a question or concern, and you just need a little bit of guidance, our office is here to help. So please make sure that you reach out to us. You can always call our office 401-456-0686.